fall. I'm sorry, it's me on Easter Sunday. <laughs> when Carol had told me her day it dawned on me, I, I thought, oh my gosh, me on Easter? I said, why did it feel or Donald or Marla or Carol? So sorry for that. And the other thing I want to tell you real quick, I was in Nashville yesterday working and I saw, I heard a plane and it was like real low and I thought, well, then I saw I was pulling a banner and I thought, oh, they are advertising a sale or something on Easter. So I stood there until I got where I could read. Or then I thought, well, maybe somebody's asking them to marry them, you know, how they do that in bed. And when it got beside me, it said, he is risen. I was like, oh, that was so, so I just wanted to share that. <laughs> okay. The Old Testament lesson today comes from Exodus 15, 1 through 11. Your pew Bible, page 50. The Israelites celebrate the Lord's victory over the Egyptians. Israel escaped to freedom by crossing the Red Sea on foot. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. <clears throat> Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters had covered them, then sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, has majestic and power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you, throw, you threw them down, those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger, it consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils, the water piled up. The surging water stood firm like a wall. The deep waters engaled in the heart of the sea. The enemy boasted, I will pursue, I will overtake them. I will divide the soils, I will gorge myself on them. I will draw my sword and my hand will destroy them. But you blew with your breath and the sea covered them, then sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? The New Testament comes from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11, Pew Bible 8, 15. Paul begins his instructions in our resurrection by reminding us that the essentials of the good news, Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and appearance to his disciples. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as of the first of importance. This Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he, ha that he was buried, that he was risen on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living. Though some people have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. The last of, the, uh, the last of all he appeared to, he also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecute the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and has grace to me was not without effect. <clears throat> no, I worked harder than all of them, yet not, but I, I but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was or that it, this is what we preached and this is what you believe. Please stand if able for the reading of the gospel. And it comes today from Luke 24, 1 through 12, Pew Bible, page 748. Luke's account of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wandering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood, out, stood beside them. In their, fight, <clears throat> in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, 
Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must, he, must be delivered into the hands of the sinful men who crucified, and on the third day he rise, he third day be risen again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all the things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them whom told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to be like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the stripes of the linen <clears throat> laying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. You may be seated. <coughs> This year during Lent, as is the custom in many places, we looked at the words from the cross. Jesus spoke seven times while he was hanging on the cross, according to the Gospels. And we treasure those words, precious words, words filled with promises, even as Jesus was dying. A little less often we talk about, we kind of group together the words of Jesus after he rose from the dead, and that's what I'd like to do this morning. Jesus, the words from the empty tomb, if you will, or the words from the risen Christ. Uh, and not too long ago, when the Billy Graham magazine came out, I, I noticed that they reprinted an article of, or a sermon actually by Billy Graham, and mine's not going to be as good as his, of course, but then I'm not him. There's only one Billy Graham, so you're stuck with me. But uh, he had four sayings from the cross. I have six. And I suppose if you ask a lot of people, you could come up with all kind of different numbers. How many times Jesus spoke? Of course, if you look in your red letter Bibles, you'll see he spoke lots of times, dozens of times, just in our Bibles. He appeared over a period of 40 days to his disciples. And so he spoke a lot. He taught them about the kingdom of God. But as the words we have in Scripture, uh, as they're recorded, I've grouped them into seven kind of categories and, and made kind of some summary statements, the six words from the resurrected uh, Jesus. And the first one is, go and make disciples of all nations. Go make disciples of all nations. This, of course, you might recognize as being the, uh, the central statement of the Great Commission. And we're all familiar with that verse, at least I hope you are. Matthew, uh, the last thing Jesus said, according to Matthew, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, which makes sense since he rose from the dead. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So go and make disciples. That's his command. And every gospel has some form of that great commission in it. Some of them look a little bit different than others. John simply says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. That's what Jesus told the twelve yet on Easter night when he appeared. But all four Gospels have some form of the Great Commission in the book of Acts as well. Acts 1 verse 8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. That's our job. That's the one thing more than anything else, I think, that Jesus wanted to get across to his disciples. He said at the Last Supper, it's better for you that I go away. Something that I'm sure was incomprehensible to them until later. It's better for you that I go away than that I stay with you. For if I do not go, the Holy Spirit cannot come. And the Holy Spirit came and enabled them to go. That was the point of him coming, was to go and make disciples of all nations. Keith Green used to often say, a famous uh, musician, he's since died in a plane wreck, but uh, he's, his music is still played quite often. He used to say, Jesus told us to go. It should be the exception if we stay. That's words that kind of gets in there and makes you think, what am I doing? Am I going and making disciples or am I just sitting? But the point is, it's the first word, not the first in time, but the first in importance. Go, make disciples of all nations. Second word, 
Look and see, it's truly I who am speaking to you. It's really me. It's me. I'm Jesus. I'm not a ghost. And as you read through all the Gospels in the uh, resurrection accounts, one thing that always comes through very clearly is that they all doubted. Even Mary Magdalene, she's the one person of all the people, she's the one who is listed by name in all four Gospels. And not only is she listed, she's the first one at the tomb. She's the first one to see Jesus and obviously the first one to believe. And yet she needed a little convincing herself. She didn't know it was him at first until he spoke to her by name and called her by name. But all the disciples, you know, Thomas has the uh, stigma attached to his name and we so much so that we know him as doubting Thomas. But you look and read through there, and they all doubted. And not only that, they all doubted, just like Thomas, they needed to see him and touch him. It wasn't until Jesus appeared to them and said, look at my hands and feet, see, it's me. It wasn't until that point when the rest of the disciples believed. But Jesus spoke again and again in Luke 24, he showed them his hands and feet, and they were still wondering about it. And then, then he said, do you have anything here to eat? And so they gave him a fish, and he ate it. Ghosts don't eat. You know, everybody knows that, right? <laughs> Ghosts don't eat. Jesus ate fish in their presence to show them it was really him. Look and see, it is truly I who am speaking to you. I heard a story once about people at a Gideon's banquet. And they're talking about this very thing. The one, the one Gideon's banquet I've ever been to, um, the, the focus of the speech that time was the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing, of course, is Jesus, and specifically the crucifixion and resurrection. But, of course, you know, when you're at the Gideon's banquet, that's what you talk about is Jesus and the resurrection. He's alive. He's real. He's Lord and God and Savior. But some at this particular table, at this particular banquet, were noting that they had heard that there were actually preachers, some pastors that didn't believe that Jesus actually arose from the dead, that that was a true story. That was more like just a fable told to make a point. And everybody went around telling stories that they heard and, and really not believing it. It's like, well, how could a pastor believe that? But there was a pastor at that particular table on this night and they asked him what he thought, whether he'd heard of such a thing, that there were pastors that actually didn't believe in the resurrection. And, and he actually was one of those who said, no, I don't believe that he physically rose from the dead. Well, I'm sure the rest of the Gideons were praying for him that night, but uh, this is a fact. You know, Jesus spoke time and time again to the disciples. Look and see, it's me. Touch my hands. It's really me who arose from the dead. If we want to be Christian, this is one of the things we have to believe. Romans 10 says, if you believe in your heart that Christ rose from the dead, and if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, then you will be saved. Without that, you're just deceiving yourself if you believe you're Christian. Jesus really is alive, and one of the words he spoke after his resurrection was, Look and see, it's truly I who am speaking to you. The third word from the resurrection, Jesus. Go to Galilee ahead of me. He told the disciples that. He told them that before he even was crucified. He told the angels to let the people know who came to the tomb. And he told Mary himself, go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee ahead of me. There they will see me. And that's kind of like some of those words from the cross. I'm thirsty. Behold your mother, behold your son. It's like, well, what does that have to do with a lot, really? But Jesus' work on earth, his main work was done. He had achieved the forgiveness of sins for all mankind. He had suffered the price of our sins. He had rose from the dead. But he had some more preparation of his disciples to do. And so he told them to go to Galilee to meet him there where he could be alone with them, to instruct them in silence away from the crowds so that they could be close to Jesus 
without distraction. And two, they would be safer away from the authorities. Go to Galilee, and I will see you there. Now, we cannot, many of us, drop everything and just go over to Galilee. That requires an airplane flight across the ocean. But we all have some quiet place that we can go to, to meet with the Lord. It's important. Jesus, every morning, the Bible says he often went out to lonely places where he prayed. He spent time alone in quiet times, in quiet places with his Father. And we're called to do the same. Find a quiet spot. Go with your Bible and with prayer and be alone with the Lord. Go to Galilee and meet Jesus there. The fourth statement. The scriptures must be fulfilled in this way. They didn't realize, the disciples didn't, that he was supposed to die. He told them many times. He told the Jewish authorities, in fact, he told everybody, he told lots of people. It was common knowledge that he said he would rise again on the third day. As we were reminded at the sunrise service earlier this morning at uh, St. John's, and the the chief priests knew it in Matthew's gospel. They went to Pontius Pilate. They said that deceiver, by whom they meant Jesus, said that he would rise on the third day, so post a guard. We need soldiers there to guard the tomb so the disciples don't come and steal his body away. So they at least suspected something would be up, but the disciples that just was out of their minds, they, they, it wasn't a possibility to them. And yet, it was prophesied throughout scriptures. As we've gone over in Good Friday, in the Psalms, for instance, uh, he would not let his Holy One see decay, nor let him see corruption, from Psalm 16. And many other verses in in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant song. After his suffering of his soul, he shall see the light of life. So Jesus had to instruct the disciples about how the scriptures were fulfilled in him. Not only in his healing the sick and preaching the good news and and healing the lame and making uh, the blind see again. But also in rising from the dead after his death on the cross. It was all foretold, and everything must be fulfilled. And Jesus did it. Jesus told the Pharisees in John chapter 5, the scriptures were all about me. You search the scriptures diligently, thinking that in them you will find eternal life, and the scriptures speak of me, Jesus said. He was, and he still is, the source of all life. The scriptures are fulfilled in him. All several hundred of the prophecies about Christ have been fulfilled except the second coming, which we still await, but could be any day. But the fact that he fulfilled the prophecies pertaining to his earthly ministry gives us confidence that he will fulfill the rest, especially that he rose from the dead. The scriptures are all about Jesus. They must be fulfilled in this way. Fifthly, Jesus said, Peace be unto you. Similarly, do not be afraid. We know anytime angels are involved in the Bible, they appear to people. Anytime God appears to people, they're afraid for good reason. You know, any of you have been watching the uh, Bible series, for instance, the, the soldiers there are not just little uh, babies with wraps of cloth around them and stuff. They're warriors. Now, I don't know what the angels looked like in Sodom or Jericho or anywhere else, but they were probably a little closer to the people on the Bible movie than they are to the postage stamp babies. There is an angel that killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night. Powerful beings. People were afraid. They fainted dead away when an angel appeared. How much more so when Christ the Lord, the one who was dead and is now alive, how much more would fear be the first response? But Jesus says, do not be afraid. Jesus says, peace be unto you. Jesus sought to calm troubled souls, to give rest to the weary and peace to the troubled and hope to his followers. 
These are some of his promises that he still gives to us today. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. In the world you will have many troubles, but take heart. I have overcome the world. If we hitch our wagon to Jesus, there's no place that we can go that can give us fear. Because peace, the peace of the Lord, will be with us. We remember also that peace is a fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which is freely given to all believers through Jesus Christ or by Jesus. So the fifth resurrection statement, peace be unto you. And finally, our sixth statement, I will send you the Holy Spirit throughout Jesus' ministry and even more the night of the Last Supper and right before he rose from the, uh, ascended into heaven. He promised the Holy Spirit. He promised. Earlier, as I mentioned, he said, it was better for you that I go away so that the Holy Spirit can come to you. He also said, you will do even greater things than I have done. Because the Holy Spirit is coming. We fulfill the Great Commission because Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. And as Jesus said in John 15, that great chapter, the vine and branches chapter, I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. But with me, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do all things. And Jesus, again, in the book of Acts, again, the last thing he said before he went to heaven, according to Acts 1, you will be filled with power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I will send you the Holy Spirit. And so there are the six words as I see them from Jesus' lips, the six words of the resurrected Jesus. Go, make disciples. See, it is truly I who am speaking to you. Go to Galilee ahead of me. These things are written about me in the scriptures. Peace be unto you. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. May we take Jesus' resurrection words to heart also, to trust in Jesus, our living Savior, to forgive us, to save us, to give us hope, and to send us out to do his work now and always. Amen. Let's